Joel Hunter, Penn State Extension, and uh, I've judged the uh, hay and grain uh, exhibitor department 38 at Crawford County Fair for a couple of years now, and uh, always done it in real time, but we'll give it a try virtually here today. Uh, just before I start, I wanted to uh, throw something out there, and that's about plants. Plants take water, sunlight, and carbon dioxide, and out of that they make oxygen, sugar, and more. It's a wonderful thing. They use the sunshine to create food, nutrients, and other essentials for other living things. And I'm pleased to work with these plants today. First, I'd like to do the talk about the hay. It is the hay and grain department. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly large depart, uh, exhibit department. Uh, there's four sections, there's a couple dozen of divisions, and I think there's about 50 uh, different entries that could actually be made if someone wanted to endeavor to try to make uh, an entry in every item. So we'll talk first about hay, since we've got the hay, a couple examples of the hay uh, here on the table. Hay is generally a, a, a perennial crop, which means uh, it keeps coming back year after year from the roots. You don't have to reseed it. And in Pennsylvania, it's typically a grass or a legume or a combination of grass and legume. Uh, and uh, recently, in the last few years at least, uh, Crawford County was ranked seventh in the state uh, for, hay, for the amount of hay crop that we produce. And uh, along with that, I, I believe that's one of the reasons the hay competition is quite popular. Uh, the judging's typically done with sensory analysis, and I'd like to start out today with that, talking a little bit about our sen century sensory analysis of hay. So the first, the first thing on the uh, sensory analysis, it, there's five categories or parameters uh, that we can judge. And uh, the hay sample is examined visually and points can be given to the sample based on a point system that we've de uh, someone's developed over time. I have to note this system is inaccurate and subject to bias, uh, uh, to biased opinion. However, the system is widely used because it can be done quickly and there's no cost or delay as with some of the other methods. This method does not, however, substitute for a good chemical analysis uh, of the forage for feeding purposes. So the first category uh, the first two categories actually uh, have the potential for uh, 30 points each. So with just uh, doing well in the first two categories, uh, we could be 60% uh, optimally and still three categories to be judged in. So the first category is maturity and that's uh, a good indicator of uh, quality the earlier it's cut typically the higher quality it is. So we have five, six divisions, I guess, uh, and there's a potential five points between each of the uh, uh, items. So the first item is early bud or before. Uh, if that's the ideal value of 30, uh, if it was ideal hay, next would be late bud, anywhere from 25 points. Uh, or centered around 25 points. Early flower would be uh, 20 points, late flower 15 points, early seed pod 10 points, and late seed pod five points. So that's a lot of uh, uh, number crunching, I guess, if you will. But stemmy fiber in uh, the bottom line, stemmy fiber is less digestible and less nutritious uh, because of lower corn, uh, crude protein and lower energy uh, compared to uh, leafy hay. And the next category, again 30 points potential, is leafiness itself. The relative leaf content 
uh, is a real good indicator of uh, quality and the absence of uh, STEMI uh, lignified uh, uh, material which would lower that point. Next is just the general condition. I was remarking while we were setting up here that this first bale was just recently cut. It's got a beautiful uh, aroma to it. It really smells like good hay. It is good hay. It looks like good hay. I would judge it as good hay. Uh, but uh, along with the, the moisture content of the hay, any mustiness, any obvious damage from insect or disease, uh, even li uh, leaf shatter, if it, not so much with grass, but with the legumes like alfalfa and clover. Uh, if we've raked it or manipulated it too many times trying to get it uh, to dry, sometimes when we open that bale up we've got more stems than leaves. So those first two categories, again, worth 30 points. Uh, wetness, mustiness, insect disease damage, the condition in general is worth 20 points. And then we have just two more cat, uh, parameters, foreign material. Uh, so we take off one point for each different weed species and one point for old stems found. Uh, and then finally color. We like a nice green color. It's not critical. Uh, you can still have very good nutritious quality, uh, even if it's not a, 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 an attractive green color. Uh, it indicates high vitamin content. And it's just pleasingly aesthetic, aesthetic when somebody sees that nice green color uh, versus uh, something that's been weathered a little bit, whether that's heavy dew or maybe caught a little rain or just uh, laid out in the field for more than a couple days. Uh, it starts to bleach and you lose the green color. So there's a hundred points on sensory analysis of hay. And uh, here we have two first cuttings of hay. This is orchard grass uh, off a dairy farm, very high quality. Again, uh, the color is about all I would uh, uh, lower the score for. Uh, this one has some nice greener color, uh, but it was a little later. I can tell from some of the other uh, uh, native grass and uh, broadleaf species uh, have flowered and, and uh, that would have been a later cutting, probably the end of uh, May. Uh, typically we cut that in the middle of May around these parts. And then uh, these second cuttings were probably made about the end of June or the beginning of, uh, of July. And uh, again, they look pretty good. They're, they've got uh, nice leaf content. Uh, maybe a little past maturity because of the, again, the heads and some of the weeds that have shown up. And this one has a fair amount of clover in it, uh, grass and clover. It's also got a fair amount of weeds. So we've probably got them pretty much lined up in the order uh, based on the sensory analysis. All right, now I'd like to talk a little bit about the grain. Again, it's the... Uh, uh, Department 38, hay and grain. So we just covered the grain. Uh, and the three grains, we can't talk about all the grains you could enter in the, uh, in the fair here, but uh, we can talk about the three, three main ones. And that would be uh, corn, soybeans, and wheat, which I have in front of us here between the uh, bales of hay. Uh, two of these are summer annuals. They, they germinate in the spring, uh, complete, complete their life cycle that year, later that year. Wheat, though, is generally a winter annual. So we would plant wheat in the fall. It doesn't grow much, but come spring, it's uh, ready, ready, set, go, and it's one of the first things to grow uh, in the spring, and we'd harvest that the second year, a winter annual. Two of these are grasses, obviously the corn and the wheat, and one's a broadleaf, uh, the soybean. The, the soybean is also a legume in that it can fix its own nitrogen out of the air so we don't have to uh, supplement uh, the fertility with any nitrogen fertilizer. So uh, that's in the uh, characteristic of other plants in the pea and the bean family. 
Uh, we'll start off though talking about corn. Uh, there are basically six types of corn and I think we have four or five of them uh, in as uh, items that could be an entry here in the fair. Uh, so that would be dent or field corn, which I have here. Uh, uh, it could be flint or Indian corn. Uh, we all seem to like sweet corn. Uh, the fourth is a flour corn uh, made uh, for chips and tortillas and that kind of thing, grown specifically for that. Popcorn, finally the fifth, and then something called pod corn, and that's a wild type and the origin of our corn today, all, all the kinds of our corn today. So, so from a tall grass from 10,000 years ago, uh, the people alive at that time found this plant and called it teosinte, uh, or grain of the gods. Teosinte had an ear that was only two or three inches long, about as long as your fingers, uh, and it had only five to maybe as many as a dozen kernels on each year. And over the years, again, millennium, like 10,000 years of development, uh, today, we have higher quality and higher yield by far, and it's not unusual to see a foot-long ear that weighs over a pound uh, and has as many as 500 or more kernels per ear compared to the 5 to 12 that the original teosinte grass uh, had. It was believed to have originated in the Americas, so Mexico, Central America, South America, and around the Caribbean. Uh, the U.S. and a few other English-speaking countries use the word corn, but the rest of the world refers to this crop as maize. maize. Uh, today, corn's the number one crop grown in the U.S., where it's the, the leader in production and consumption at about 14 and a half billion bushels per year. Half of that goes to feed, to feed livestock. A third of it goes to ethanol production. 13% uh, is exported, 6% are sweeteners, 2% are starch, and only 1% of the corn goes into alcoholic beverages. Uh, what's more, only 1.5% is used to make cereal and other food, such foods. Next, we'll talk about soybean. Soybean or soja, as uh, they call it some places, uh, is again a legume in the pea and bean family. It offers a wealth of health benefits. Uh, soybean's one of the few plants that provides a complete protein, as it contains all eight amino acids essential for our own health. It contains 38% uh, protein in the bean form, or as they squeeze the oil out of the bean, that uh, rises to 44% crude protein in the meal. Soybeans produce four times as much meal as they do oil. The separated oil is the majority feedstock for biodiesel globally. Soybeans were a crucial crop in East Asia long before written records began. There is evidence for soybean domestication between 7,000 and 6,600 B.C. in China, uh, between 5,000 and 3,000 B.C. in Japan, and one, about 1,000 B.C. in Korea. Soybeans were first introduced to North America from China in 1765, so just before the Revolutionary War, by a sailor, Samuel Bowen, who brought them from China. Soybeans are again, are again are native to East Asia, but are now widely cultivated and consumed across the globe. The main countries growing soybeans are the United States with about 32% of the world total, Brazil close behind with about 31%, Argentina 18%, uh, and uh, so, uh, South America as a whole, Brazil and uh, Argentina in the last few years have overtaken uh, our old position as the uh, largest producer of soybeans in the world. 
In the U.S., the soybeans are grown mostly in the Corn Belt, the top producing states, Illinois, Iowa, Indiana, but uh, they also have pretty good crops in Minnesota, Nebraska, Missouri, and Ohio. And about 85% uh, globally is processed into, processed into soybean oil and meal. Okay, finally we're down to the wheat here. Uh, wheat is also a member of the grass family like corn. It's widely cultivated for its seed, a cereal grain which is a worldwide staple food. Uh, there are many species of wheat, but about 95% of the wheat produced is common wheat, also known as bread wheat. Common wheat is the most widely grown of all crops globally and the cereal with the highest monetary yield value. Uh, wheat is the third largest crop in the U.S. Uh, following corn and soybeans. The archaeological record suggests that wheat was first cultivated in the regions of the Fertile Crescent, also known as the Cradle of Civilization, again around the time of corn, about 9600 B.C., uh, almost as long as corn. Wheat was first planted in the United States uh, in 1777, again uh, just a little after the start of the revolution, as a hobby crop. Today wheat is grown to some extent on every continent in the world with the exception obviously of Antarctica. Wheat is grown on more land than any other food crop. Uh, five, uh, 544.6 million acres, that's over a half a billion of acres uh, so that produce wheat worldwide. Uh, the, it's a major diet component uh, of, in, it is a major diet component because of the wheat plant's wide agronomic ad, ad, adaptability to grow from near Arctic regions to the equator and from sea level to the high plains of Tibet, approximately 13,000 feet above sea level. In 2018, world production of wheat was 432 billion bushels, making it the second most produced cereal after corn. Uh, world trade in wheat is greater than for all other crops combined. So that's what I had to share with you today in place of uh, the real crops and or hay and grain uh, judging and uh, uh, it's nice to come to you anyway even though virtual and I hope you got something out of it. I'd encourage you, you don't have to have a farm or be a farmer. Uh, look at the hay and grain department in the uh, fairs uh, publication and uh, you can plant you know, a couple sunflower plants or a couple corn plants, and wheat, soybean, whatever. Uh, there's 50 items, I believe, roughly to choose from just in this hay and grain department alone. So with that, I'll say so long and hope to see you in a real format next year.